Welcome to another edition of The Public Interest. My name is David Granger. And on this series of programs, we deal with topics which are of interest to Guyanese at home and in the diaspora. And in fact, to, to everybody around the world to find out what is going on in this um, new oil state. Um, and today we'll deal with a topic, um, particularly um, one, it's not historical, but we, we would like to know, and people now still like to know how, why so many persons were killed during the, uh, the so-called troubles, the first decade of this millennium. And um, the, re the reason for that is that many people living now have lost uh, friends and relatives, you know, parents and children, and uh, they don't have answers. And last month, August, uh, during the funerary arrangements for the former head of the presidential secretariat and chairman of the Joint Intelligence uh, uh, Committee, um, a lot of things were said, which reopened the wounds. Um, even the, the son of one of the victims, one of the most notorious victims of the, of the massacres, is asking, well, if you know the reason why these people were killed, if you know the, 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 um, the bandits who did the killing, um, uh, why not uh, investigate? Why not solve the problems? And this is what, is the, this is what affects Guyanese today. Why were so many people killed during the troubles? We know that the PPP administration was the first to explain that the mem, the massacres and the murders that were taking place during this period of the troubles in the early 2000s was the result of a drug gang warfare. This is the word that was, uh, this is the expression that was used by the head of the presidential secretary, drug gang warfare. Um, it was an ethnic conflict. It was not a social upheaval. It's drug gang warfare. And it was being waged um, by Phantom gangs, you know, he was the inventor of that expression, phantom gangs. And um, he spoke of death squads. So we are left with these expressions, drug gang warfare, phantom gangs, and death squads. My friends, the troubles, the first decade of, of um, the present millennium was a time of assassination of a minister. Um, it was the time of the assassination of the deputy head of the Customs Anti-Narcotics Unit. It was the time of the attempted assassination of the director of public prosecution. It was the time of the alleged implication of a PPP government minister in the direction of a death squad. The alleged implication of another PPP minister in the acquisition of a computer that was given to a notorious drug trafficker to track and trace telephone communication and location of persons who were targeted to be killed. These are not matters that can be swept under the carpet. These are not historical issues. These matters affect the way Guyana was governed and is being governed today. We therefore have to deal with the question of this drug gang warfare. The expression was coined by somebody who died last month and you know, it, it, it actually asked more questions than answered. So the death has not solved the problem. The death has reopened the wounds of persons who were injured um, during the troubles. The troubles were a time of intense criminal violence, the worst criminal violence since independence in 1966. And between 2000 and 2008 or thereabouts, 1,431 murders took place, 7,865 armed robberies. These were verified statistics from the Ghana police force. It probably means that more persons were killed and we never discovered the bodies, we never heard about the crimes. The troubles were a time of lawlessness. It's a time of armed robberies, arbitrary arrests, assassination, disappearance and torture of young men. Um, it was a time of narco-trafficking and gun running, a time of manslaughter, murder, and other forms of criminal violence. And unfortunately, uh, the law enforcement agencies, particularly 
the police, uh, Guyana Police Force target special squad and behaved in a way during the troubles that was reprehensible, quite frankly. And it tarnished the reputation of the Guyana Police Force. Um, it didn't mean that all policemen were corrupt, but certainly the identifiable actions of some members of the target special squad, you know, uh, leave much to, well, it's worse than leave much to be desired, they were criminals. And uh, some of them, some of those actions were never fully investigated. So we come back to the question, why was it necessary for so many young people to die? I mean, this was not a question of mere drug trafficking where somebody goes by some youths and, and tries to pass off uh, a few grams of, of, of uh, marijuana, a few grams of cocaine or some ecstasy tablets. This was a time that was notorious for massacres involving rogue policemen and soldiers um, who were armed and equipped and they were bandits, criminal gangs who were trained to conduct uh, murders. The worst massacres during this period that we speak about uh, took place not in one spot, but in different parts of the country. We remember the massacres on the East Bank Demerara to Agricola Eccles. We remember the massacre at uh, Bagatsong Eccles, again on the East Bank. We remember the massacre at Bartica, far away, far away from, from Buxton, Bartica. Uh, we remember the massacre at Blackbush Pole, again, far away um, from, the, from East Bank or East Coast. Uh, we remember the massacre border right outside Niger supermarket. It's called the Diwali Massacre in November 2002. We remember the killings in Buxton, Buxton Friendship. We remember the killings in Kitty, uh, La Bonne Intention. That is where um, the Minister of uh, uh, Agriculture was uh, assassinated, he and his family. We remember the killings in Lamaha Gardens and that morning in October 2002. Seven persons were killed in one morning. <laughs> Seven persons were killed in one morning. This is not something that could be swept under the carpet, my friends. We remember Lindo Creek again. In, during my presidency, I tried to have a full investigation into what happened at Lindo Creek, but um, some of the persons involved never spoke frankly and never spoke truthfully. And we haven't got to the bottom of that. In fact, I can tell you this, a very senior police officer once admitted that all the witnesses in most of these massacres that I tell you about, all the witnesses were killed. That is a big problem. Uh, we remember what happened at Luzignan um, in 2008 and at Prashad Nagar. So there are over a dozen massacres. And when I speak of a massacre, I don't speak of one or two people. I speak about three or four or more people being killed at one time. This is, uh, this is too much for such a small country. And many of us knew the victims, um, even if we did not know the perpetrators of these crimes, we knew the victims. And those memories are still with us. And uh, unfortunately, we have a government which um, claims to know um, much of what took place at that time in the Troubles. And um, some people were bold enough to say that uh, the former head of the presidential secretariat will, will go to his grave with his secrets or has gone to the grave with those secrets. Um, what do you make of that? What do you make of that? Does he bear responsibility for, for the crimes? Will we ever learn who was responsible for the crimes? It seems not. So we come to a situation in which uh, we need to look carefully at why the, so many killings took place and uh, what was responsible for the whole drug gang warfare. This was not normal crime. This is not people, 
break and enter and burglary. This is a serious planned operation that was executed on the Guyanese population. My friends, I call your attention to an annual report that comes out from the United States Department of State. It's called the International Narcotics Control Strategy Report, INCSR. And repeatedly, and you can Google it yourself, repeatedly, the INCSR referred to Guyana as, and let me quote directly, because year after year, they repeat almost the same wording, like a, I nearly said mantra, but I don't want to misuse a Hindu expression. Um, they just repeated this ad nauseum. Guyana is a transit point for narcotics to destinations in the Europe, European Union, United Kingdom, and USA. On police borders, allow illegal narcotics enter the country by air, road, or river. Petty couriers with small amounts of narcotics are frequently arrested, but major traffickers escape conviction. This is the, the uh, opinion, or this is a statement coming out of the United States Department of State for much of the decade. So when you see soldiers and policemen cleaning up the highways in, in, in blue shirts, you want to know why they're not on the borders preventing the entry of illegal narcotics. Why aren't they patrolling the areas where we know planes will land, bringing narcotics into the country? Guyana is not a producer of cocaine. So if we have a cocaine trafficking problem, it means it's coming from somewhere. But if we misemploy or underemploy um, the army and the police, cleaning up you know, Mandela Avenue, cleaning up the drains and gutters and doing municipal work, they can't be protecting the borders. And this is what the United States Department of State was saying 20 years ago. So we have a problem and we are either deliberately ignoring the problem and um, allowing criminality to continue. That is what has happened or that's what happened during the troubles and it's probably still happening today. Um, as they say, petty couriers with small amounts of narcotics are frequently arrested but major traffickers escape conviction. It was true 20 years ago, and probably it's quite true today. My friends, drug gang warfare exposed the collaboration that was taking place, or maybe the complicity of several persons. They were bandits. They were businessmen. They were criminal gangs. They were ministers of the government. They were narco traffickers, and they were rogue elements in the security forces. We all remember that one was photographed in Suriname, in Paramaribo, Suriname, um, where he had gone to transact some business in the presence of a serving policeman. So there's no doubt about the complicity uh, of elements, rogue elements of the police force in narco-trafficking at that point in time. Well, it is clear from our research and from public knowledge that narco-traffickers were able to entice or corrupt officials. They were able to recruit gangs to import illegal narcotics. Um, narcotics can be brought into this country without the cooperation of some elements. Planes can't land you know, at hinterland airstrips without people on the ground knowing that they're about to come in. The gangs were able to stockpile weapons. We don't make those weapons here, AK-47s and Taurus pistols and revolvers. They were able to expand their enterprise. Um, they're not content with just having a little stall selling drugs. They want to get rich and have a big empire. They want to extend their territory um, into the hinterland, perhaps, where the planes can land. Um, they want to enlarge the volume of narcotics. Narcotics is a very profitable business, and they wanted to enlarge the volume of, of narcotics. But they also wanted to eliminate competitors and antagonists 
people who got in their way. Uh, and this is where you see that once you have narcotics at this level taking place and um, being brought into the country, people will want to defend the, the territory and they will use guns, they will use violence. Once you have narco trafficking, there's going to be violence. Once there's violence, there's going to be death, as follows um, night to the day. And what was happening is that the police force was unable or unprepared or unwilling to eliminate the, the, the drug gang warfare that had broken out, the violence that had broken out. My friends, we now have to look at why they, there were so many murders. What was responsible? What were the factors responsible for this um, drug gang violence? Narco trafficking is very profitable for a few persons, but for the majority of people, it was perilous. Several factors contributed to the violence, to the virulence of the violence. One is the organization. The organization was based on permanent gangs, permanent cartels. Next, it, it was internationalization. The drugs had to be brought from outside of the country. Across the border is a transnational crime. Um, next, the trade was weaponized, that it had to be protected. So guns were brought in along with the drugs. Next, you had the criminalization of selected communities. So some communities were targeted and criminalized because these were the areas to which the drugs were being directed. And when some of the residents rejected or resisted um, bringing drugs into the community, they were killed. Um, the drugs had to be uh, sold, they had to be marketed, they had to be transported, and um, it wasn't a private affair. Some young people were recruited uh, to become the messengers or the couriers, um, and sometimes the users of these drugs. Um, this, of course, led to two things. One, the corruption of officials, because some officials knew that the planes were landing, knew the drugs were moving from the hinterland uh, on the border areas to other destinations. Some were being shipped out of the country. And we knew that many young people were being jailed. Um, those who were caught with different amounts of drugs were being jailed. And I think if you check now, the Guyana Prison Service will report that more than half of the inmates are young people under the age of 25. That is a legacy of the troubles that the significant portion of inmates in the prison system are, are young male persons. And another uh, casualty of the troubles was that a lot of young recruits were brought in to conduct the trade or to help to conduct the trade. Some of them, as you know, were called the Taliban. Um, but some of them should have been at school. But instead, you saw pictures of them carrying uh, AK-47s, or some of them got killed um, in the shootouts that, would, um, that we were told were taking place. Another reason why the, the killings went on on such a scale and for such a long time was because of the expectation of immunity. Many of these really serious drug traffickers knew that they couldn't be prosecuted. In fact, at one stage, the head of the Joint Intelligence Center actually told the media that there was no credible evidence against a certain notorious drug trafficker. But Shortly after, he made the mistake to go to Paramaribo, where suddenly um, uh, Mr. Santoki, Chandrika Prasad Santoki, who is now the president, at that time, I think he was chief of police or minister of justice, he had evidence. And the, 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 the notorious drug trafficker, you know, ended up in um, a, a detention facility, um, or what the Americans call a correctional facility on charges of narco-trafficking. So what the Guyana system could not find, 
Suriname Fund and the United States System Fund. And that is one of the reasons why Guyana in those days found it difficult to agree to the establishment of the uh, Drug, Enforcement Drug Enforcement Authority office in Guyana. And as you can see that, you know, these actions led to the perpetuation of, uh, of criminal activity, and it led to the penetration of uh, drug trafficking into wider and wider areas. So it is not just this village or that village. The drug traffickers tried to extend their territory because they felt they wouldn't be punished, that they were being protected from persons in high office. As a result, my friends, the killings became more heartless, they became more ruthless, they became more relentless. And you know, I think many people migrated from this country, many people left some of the targeted villages, and it was a period of great distress. And up to now, Guyana has not recovered. And it is almost an insult to the Guyanese nation to be told that, oh, we know who did it. You know, after you know, 20 years, well, let's punish them, let's find them. Give us the evidence that you have. Um, don't just uh, try to make other people scapegoats. And don't just try to um, blame uh, a few army officers or a few police officers. And let us get the truth. Um, we do know that the period was uh, ruthless and bloody. And in all fairness, I can say that the PPP administration at the time did go through the motions of drafting laws, but unfortunately, the enthusiasm for drafted laws was not equal by enthusiasm for enforcing those laws. To start with, even the first year after the escape of some convicts from the Georgetown prison, the Mashamani escape, the PPP drafted a nine-point paper. Oh, they're going to review legislation. They're going to have comprehensive re review of the intelligence sector. They're going to establish a, a training center for law enforcement. They're going to establish a SWAT team, a special weapons and you know um, tactics team. Um, and uh, several bills were passed in the National Assembly, either to update existing legislation or to bring in new legislation. Paperwork was fine, but the enforcement was not so good. And we know too, that since 1999, the British government had been sending them repeated consultancies, um, reports, investigations, advisories on how we could deal with the crime problem. And all of this culminated in something called the Security Sector Reform Action Plan. And within days, I mean, after a decade of preparatory work, of investigation, of visits and consultancies and reports, um, within days of the signing of that agreement between the British High Commissioner, Fraser Wheeler, and the head of the Presidential Secretary, the PPP government just simply said, you know, we can't accept the, the plan. Uh, the result is the plan was never enforced. So a year's, uh, a decade's work was just thrown out of the window. And because of the non-enforcement or non-acceptance of the security sector reform action plan, we see that crime simply continued. Uh, so we lost, um, it, it valued um, over 4.9 million pounds sterling. You can convert that into Guyana dollars, over a trillion dollars in Guyana dollars. We lost that plan. It was not until AP and UFC got into office that we tried to re-engage the British government. And in fact, our consultant was sent down and we started working on reforming the police force. And if you look at what happened between 2005 uh, 2015 and 2020, you can see there's a reduction in piracy, a reduction in drug trafficking, a reduction in, in banditry and murders. But <laughs> things started to go awry again. So 
Once that security sector reform action plan was abandoned, um, we saw the floodgates open to criminality. We now come to the question of the consequences. What does all of this mean? And I started uh, uh, this program by asking, why did so many people have to die? And we must see that the reason lies in the fact that there were people in high office who did not want to bring narco-trafficking to an end. We see that the PPP had decided not to deal de uh, decisively with serious crimes and the sources of drug trafficking. Um, they did not want to deal decisively with gold smuggling, and that is a, still a problem. With gun running, that is still a problem. With money laundering, that is still a problem. With narco-trafficking, that is still a problem. And these were the factors that prolonged the troubles and caused such a large number of murders and the massacres, massacres which were taking place. And we saw also that the practice of elements of the police force, rogue elements of the police force being recruited by drug traffickers. These are serving police um, policemen um was was um i would suppose sanctioned if not encouraged by the uh, the authorities at the time so the police force instead of protecting citizens instead of punishing criminals um were doing the opposite um and this led to a collapse of confidence in the police people no longer trusted the police force um, and this is the result of the misbehavior, misconduct of some members of the force. Not all members of the force, but some members of the force. They brought this credit um, to the, the, the Ghana police force. My friends, the troubles, this deadly period between 2000 and 2010, um, caused a lot of grief to the country. And we know that this drug gang warfare that was announced by the head of the presidential secretary, his words, not mine, he said we were experiencing drug gang warfare. This drug gang warfare was the result of the failure of the PPP administration or the decision of the PPP administration not to respond to certain types of criminal behavior. And the evidence for this is that ministers were complicit in the criminality. The mismanagement of the defense and police forces, um, the demoralization of officers um, was a contributory factor. The failure to eliminate the sources of drug trafficking um, all of these factors contributed to the continuity of the, the troubles, the, the killings. Um, Present-day criminal violence is a product of the subculture of, of violence, guns and drugs, imported elements of transnational crime, guns and drugs. We don't make either guns or drugs. And that is what brought Guyana to its knees. Um, and no amount of bluff would erase the damage that has been done in that period. I do believe that narco trafficking can be crushed or at least curtailed. To do this, the PPP administration now needs to continue, consider reinforcing the National Drug Strategy Master Plan. Many of you may not even know there's a National Drug Strategy Master Plan. It was there since, um, you know, 1990 with President Desmond Hoyt. There's a national, it may be called something else now, but the PVP has to enforce the National Drug Strategy Master Plan. Ask them about it. It has to reestablish the National Anti-Narcotics Agency Narco-trafficking cannot be managed by the Customs Anti-Narcotics Unit. A canoe cannot do what a warship should be doing. Canoe can't do what a battleship needs to do. 
The National Anti-Narcotics Agency is a serious agency to eliminate narco trafficking. And we need to re-implement the National Security Sector Reform Action Plan, either in the form that it was introduced by the British government or a new form, but let the public see that the police force is being seriously reformed. Because no part of the police force um, will be able to successfully do its duties unless there's root and branch reform of that organization. And unless that is done, the war against narco traffickers cannot be won. And we, the present generation, will be denying young people a safe future and a good life in this country of their birth. Thank you, and may God bless you. Each man must